All right, I want you to think in your head on a scale of zero to 10 where zero sucks and 10 is awesome, how likely are you to recommend Netflix to a friend? So all of you that have a nine or a 10, put your arms in the air. Good. And those that give it a seven or eight, put your arms in the air. Good. And those zero to six, arms in the air. I love you. Okay, I love you too. Okay, cool. Okay, so quick calculation. The NPS is around 70. What could make Netflix better for you, Rob? He wants more and different original content, okay? I mean, the reason that I love Rob is if you chase these people and they're discontent, that's how great things happen. So I went with a local for you. Customers are always beautifully, wonderfully dissatisfied, even when they report being happy and business is great. Even when they don't know it yet, customers want something better. And your desire to delight, to delight customers will drive you to invent on their behalf. So chasing those folks with the zero to six, it provides a true north for a company. And that's what customer obsession does. If you follow that, great things happen. So I want to tell you a little bit about my early career. I was at Electronic Arts building bang, bang, shoot 'em ups and I, I, I believed in this concept of customer focus. And I listened to customers. These are all the letters that I got from the capital G gamers. I read them all. And it wasn't particularly helpful. At, back then, you were trained to put a photo of your competitor on your desk. This is training like, from Microsoft. I was competitive. That didn't help. And I was trained to satisfy customers. My next company is a kid's software company called Creative Wonders. This was my first hit software. It was called Elmo's Preschool. And I learned how to delight two, three, and four-year-old kids. And this was a big moment for me. That and the fact that El Oprah Winfrey threw Tickle Me Elmo's out onto the stage one show. That's called good luck. And then I built a kid's software company. All these characters, Schoolhouse Rock, and sold that company to this dude. Do you recognize him? This is Mr. Wonderful. This is Kevin O'Leary of Shark Tank. Helped the learning company to grow. How many of you have used Oregon Trails? OK, that's how freaking old I am. I worked on that, OK? And then turned around, and we sold the learning company to Mattel. And this is how Kevin O'Leary made his money. Sold it for $4 billion. However, a year later, the company was spun out, and it had lost 90% of its value. And this was when I learned a lot. And Kevin still kept the money. But this is when I learned a lot about the concept of building long-term and durable, durable hard-to-copy advantage. This is Reed Hastings. Netflix began as a DVD by mail company. I hope you remember that. And I interviewed with Reed. He's the CEO of Netflix. And he really asked me two questions. The first was, hey, Gib, can you delight customers? I said, Jesus, I built Elmo's preschool. And luckily, both of his kids had used the software and liked it. And the second question he asked me, he said, can you do consumer science? And luckily, I knew what he meant. Because I had asked him, what, what did you want your legacy to be? And the legacy he wanted was this notion of consumer science. He's like, I'm kind of a geeky engineer. Like, I don't have the vision or the sense of style that a Steve Jobs has. But the idea is we can create an environment where we can test every idea to figure out if it resonates with customers. That is the notion of consumer science. And that's what I hope to be. And so I, when he asked me that question, I lied a little. I said, yeah, I can do consumer science. I had taken one statistic course in business school. And it was just barely good enough. So what I want to talk about is this transition. I've really got two stories for you. One is from this world of customer focus, my early days of satisfying customers, listening and competing, to this fundamentally better world that I discovered, which is all about customer obsession. Can you delight customers? Can you experiment madly to invent a better future? The other part of this journey is from a really, really, really sucky Netflix. This is the early days. Designers in the house, you can verify that this sucks. This is how all startups suck in the beginning. And this is what the experience looked like last night for me. How many of you have watched When They See Us? 
And you'll notice in this presentation, I give way too, uh, I reveal way too much about my bizarre movie tastes. This is a very personalized experience for me. So I've got three chapters for you in this notion of customer obsession. The first is I want to talk about the DHM model. That's simply delighting customers in these hard to copy, margin enhancing ways. I want to take you on a journey of consumer science in one area of Netflix, which is all about personalization. And then I'm going to use a current case, a case from today, where Netflix needs your help in answering one simple question. Should they send a free trial reminder 27 days into the free trial to remind you that your free trial is about to end? That's the case. The product leader's job, it is incredibly hard, but I, I've had a very consistent and simple way of talking about the job, which is the job is to delight customers in these hard to copy, margin enhancing ways. And margin enhancing is just a fancy way of saying, make money to create more value so that you can invest it in building a better and better and better product in the future. The tricky part about this, it is a balancing act. I know how to delight all of you. Lower the price. Cut it in half for all of you and get the same content you want. That doesn't help the business. And it's unsupportable in the long term. So I'm going to show you one of our first A-B tests at Netflix where we learned about this balancing act between delight and margin. If you think back to 2005 with Netflix, we had a problem. Everybody wanted the new release DVD. The moment it came out, it showed up at a theater, and two months later, we had lots of DVDs. We had 50,000 people who wanted them, but we could only afford to buy 25,000, which meant a lot of people had to wait. And if you talk to consumers in focus groups, if you did surveys, if you looked at the customer support data, it was all saying the same thing. We want our new release DVDs faster. That's what everybody was dying for. And so what we did, this is then, back then we had about a million customers. We did the perfect new release test. So if you were one of these 10,000 customers in a perfect new release experience, you would add a, a, a DVD to the top of your queue, a new release DVD, and it would show up the next day in the mail. It was amazing. And the question here, those 10,000 people in a perfect new release experience, did they, were they delighted? And our measurement for delight was retention. Did they cancel at the end of the month? Now, in the early days of Netflix, about 10% of its customers would cancel every month. Today, about 2% cancel every month. Back then, it was about 4.5%, 5% of our customers would cancel every month. And the question is, could you improve the retention of those customers that were in this perfect new release experience? Are you curious to know the result? How many believe that it's actually going to change customers' behavior? We will see a change in retention with this perfect new release. Anybody want to commit with an arm in the air? I promise not to cold call you. A few. How many believe there will be no difference? Wow. OK. So there is a difference. <laughs> but it's very, very small. Surprisingly small. It went from 4.5% canceling to only 4.45. And if you do the math here, if you rolled it out to all of our million members, we would save 5,000 customers. We would keep 5,000 customers from canceling with this perfect new release experience. And we put a valuation on that. We said it was worth about a million bucks because they're the 5,000 customers that we saved and we multiplied it by the lifetime value of a customer which at the time was about 100 bucks, And then we doubled it. And we doubled it for a word of mouth factor. Our idea was if somebody had a great experience, they would tell a friend or a family, and they, we would bring in a new customer for free. So we gave it a 2x word of mouth factor. So this was the value of saving 5,000 customers. It's about a million bucks. But guess what? If we were to get additional new release inventory for all of our members, that would cost five million bucks. That's the cost of getting 
additional new release DVD. So we, we have a balancing act. We, we, we only created value of about a million bucks, but we spent five million. We were surprised. This is the thing that everybody said they wanted better, and we made it better, and they didn't value it nearly as much. So a simple question for you. How many of you want to launch this new release experience with perfect DVD delivery to all? Hands in the air. I always get a handful. I appreciate this. And how many think the math just doesn't add up and let's not freaking launch it? I should see almost every other hand. OK, I saw the handful. So 95% say, do not launch this. 5% say, let's launch it. And the best thinking is really about this word of mouth factor. What if the word of mouth factor was 8x? Then the math works out. Amazon often will talk about an 8x word of mouth factor. But unfortunately, we just didn't have the money. And my CFO, Barry, was just apoplectic of, of doing a 2x factor. So we did not launch this. But this shows you this balancing act between delight and margin. So the other part of the equation is building stuff that's hard to copy so you don't have this freaking moment in Mattel where suddenly everything you built turns to zero value or one-tenth of its value. So what is hard to copy about Netflix? I give you 100 million bucks to do a startup to compete with Netflix, and what do you find challenging? What is the hard to copy advantage that Netflix has today? Louder. OK, it's the original content. And that is because of this huge economy of scale. Last year, Netflix could spend $11 billion on its original, co original content. And poor Amazon could only spend 3 or $4 billion, OK? Or Hulu, only $1 or $2 billion. This is an advantage that's hard to copy, economy of scale. What else has Netflix got? Data. They've got a huge amount of data. They've got the unique technology around personalization. They know the member taste of 500 million people around the world. They know what you want to watch and what you don't want to watch. What else is hard to copy? Other intellectual property and the brand. You trust it with your credit card every month. And there's only one other issue I'm fishing for. There's a huge device ecosystem network effect they have. Any device in the world today is pre-wired to let you stream Netflix. Anyways, I'll tell you my first illustration of, of teaching a product manager of why hard to copy is so frickin' important. This is the work that H.B. Mock did. He was so proud because he put this family on a couch and everybody clicked on the red Start Now button. He improved conversion a lot. I'm like, H.B., that's wonderful to delight customer, but I'd love it if you could do it hard to copy ways. Because I'm just betting you, within a month, those bastards from Blockbuster are going to have a freaking happy family on a couch. <laughs> which is exactly what they did. And this is the lesson in creating that hard to copy advantage. It's all about building a brand, the unique technology, building a network effect, and having these economy of scale. This is the job, to delight customers in these hard to copy margin-enhancing ways. These are all of our experiments over 10 years. These were trying to answer the question how we were going to delight customers in hard-to-copy margin-enhancing ways. And think for a moment. You know, it worked out for Netflix. Out of these eight tries, how many worked? And the answer is only three. These were the things in the early days that actually did those three things. And it turned out that initially opening up our APIs failed, but that also enabled creating value with every device in the world. And we actually tested original content under Red Envelope Studios in 2008, 2009. It failed, but it worked in 2012, 2013 with House of Cards, mainly because at that time we had this economy of scale, finally. Look in the bottom quarter. There's friends. If you're in Silicon Valley in 2005, 6, 7, 8, every frickin' VC is asking the same question because of this little punk startup called Facebook. And they're asking the question, what about social? What's your social strategy? So we created something called Friends. Does anybody here remember Friends? Oh, poor Friends, yes. 
our idea was you would connect with your friends on Netflix, you'd get great movie ideas from your friends, and we were creating a hard to copy network effect. You wouldn't leave Netflix because you didn't want to leave your friends. And after three years of banging our heads against the wall, we came to two conclusions. First, your friends' movie tastes suck, okay? <laughs> and the second is you don't really want your friends to know what you're watching, okay? So it works in many, many contexts. It just did not work for us. You know, did I mention that this is hard? So I just revealed that these eight high-level strategies, only three worked initially, and then two more worked a little later. If I want to look smart, these were the ideas that we were focused on. This is the product strategy. The answer to the question, how do you delight customers in these hard-to-copy, margin-enhancing ways? And at any moment in time, we were working on projects, on tactics, each of them against the strategy. And yes, we were focused on a high-level metric of improving retention, but we had a variety of proxy metrics. Each of these strategies had a very specific proxy metric to help us to evaluate whether the strategy was working or not in short term through these hundreds of experiments. So what I want to do is take you on this consumer science journey in one area of Netflix, trying to create a more personalized experience for you. And consumer science for me is simply developing consumer insights through these four sources. Qualitative, focus groups, talking to consumers. I did a survey at the beginning. I did a net promoter survey with you. Looking at existing data, digging in the dirt, and forming theories about, and hypotheses about what you might test in the future. And obviously at Netflix, the big dog was A-B tested. That's, how, that's the, one of the main ways that you had to learn about whether these ideas were working or not. This is the scientific method. You have a hypothesis, you test it, you look at the results, and human judgment is still required. We're not out of jobs yet when you look at the data to, to figure out what is right to do. So I just want to ground you. This is what Netflix looked like in 2005, and I'm going to share with you, over time, the series of experiments that helped to create a more personalized experiment. I want you to look at this. In 2005, there's something really stupid going on, which is we were merchandising all of those expensive new release titles that we didn't have available to ship to you the next day. Okay? That was stupid. The other thing is you can see the beginning of our, our friends thing. There's a word called recommendations. I'm sorry, this is the personalization thing in recommendations. News tip, when you're talking about personalization, talk to people in very human ways. Don't I recommend that you go out to this person for coffee, okay? You don't say that, like, hey, I think you'd enjoy meeting this person or, or, or whatever. Uh, recommendation is just a bad word in personalization. So this is what it looked like in 2005. In the product strategy, there were really four high-level theories. We were going to get all the data that we could from you about your explicit movie taste, largely through the star ratings. And then we knew at some point it would be helpful to see what you're watching, what you went 10 minutes into and, can't, and quit, the implicit data. And then the idea was we would get to know you and all your funky movie tastes. We had all the data about the movies, and then we'd magically connect them using a variety of different matching algorithms. And we had one other theory. If we could help connect you with movies that you loved, as measured by higher average movie ratings, that this would create a better experience for you and you would retain better. Now, hint, one of these theories is, is failed, but these were the high-level product strategies for Netflix. And of course, at any moment in time, we had a proxy metric to verify or not whether these product strategies were working. And I'm going to share each of these metrics and some of the projects on the journey of personalization with you. And you'll see some of these different projects against these key strategies over on the left. Now, you know how this worked out. I have a series of pop quizzes that I want you to evaluate today. And even though you know the result, you're going to discover that it was really hard making guesses 
about what would resonate with customers and what would not. So my first pop quiz, it's kind of simple. Look, I hope you notice that Netflix is already looking better. See the movies you'll heart tab? My, my designer team said, Gib, that's fugly. <laughs> Which I think is like funky plus ugly. I mean, a designer can let me know. But you can tell we're making a little progress beyond that damn recommendation word. And the proxy metric that we use for, for lots of our personalization effort, it was this simple. Our, our idea was if you gave us lots of ratings, you gave us the ratings because you appreciated the result. Movies that were better suited for you. In our proxy metric, at the end of the first six weeks of a member's life, what percent of Netflix members rated at least 50 movies? Five, zero. That's a lot. My only clue is this is a number between zero and 100%. Choose wisely. And I'm going to start at the bottom. So I want you to have a number in your head. And how many have a number between zero and five? Good. And how many are between five and 10%? Good. And how many are between 10 and 20%? And how many are between 20 and 30? OK, it's tapering off to a few hands now. And the youthful enthusiast, how many are 30 to 100? OK, there are no, oh, there's one youthful enthusiast way back in the mirror. I appreciate you. OK, so the answer is surprisingly high. It's 28%. Wow. I told you this was going to be hard, OK? And it was largely because of that one little movie Jill Hart tab. People clicked on that, and they went on these ratings jacks. They rated lots of movies in the ratings wizard. It was the invention of just this one simple idea, the ratings wizard, that gave, gave us tons of data about your explicit member taste. And this is the first signal to us that personalization might be a good thing. For folks on the, on the interwebs, uh, most of the room was between 0 and 5 and, and 5 to 10. Um, so that's how good we are guessing at this moment in time. Pop quiz number two. Now, this is my family. Uh, that's Kristen, Kelsey and White, Brittany, eyes are closed, 21 and 23-year-old daughters. That's me, the awkward 57-year-old. And my next question is this. In doing personalization around movie tastes, is it helpful to know a person's age and gender? This is a simple question. It's a yes or no. So how many people believe it's helpful, a yes, to age and gender data? And how many people believe no, it's not helpful? OK, so we had about 20% that say, no, it's not helpful, and about 80% believe it is. And the answer is, it's not helpful, which was hugely surprising to us. It's much more helpful to know one or two or three titles that a person loves than it is to know their age and gender. A really surprising result to us. How did we know if we were good at predicting people's movie tastes? Our metric was called RMSE, root mean squared error. It basically suggested that if I thought, Rob, you would like Breaking Bad four stars, and you liked it, how many stars? Three. Oh, shit, I'm off. OK? And I predict that you're going to like Gilmore Girls four stars, and your prediction is zero. I'm way freaking off. OK? This is one of those metrics where down and to the right is good. If I were perfect in, in predicting Rob's tastes, that if I predicted three for Breaking Bad and zero for Gilmore Girls, I should have known, but I also knew age and gender is not that helpful as data. Um, if I were perfect, then RMSE would go to zero. So we added the age and gender data, and it did not improve our predictive power. It was really quite surprising to us. The big dog of algorithms at Netflix in the early days was collaborative filtering. And it basically says that because Rob likes Breaking Bad four stars, Rob's like, why the hell did I sit in the front row? 
Um, I like that four stars. What's another title that you like, Rob? Justified, which he likes five stars, and you like Breaking Bad four stars and Justified five stars, and you like one other movie. What is it? Or TV show? I don't care. House of Cards, excellent choice. Collaborative filtering says because you like those two and House of Cards, Rob's going to like House of Cards. Do you like it? Five stars. The, the collaborative filtering algorithm worked, okay? Now this is done at scale. Now notice that the, the, the algorithm doesn't really know anything about the content of the movie, but, but this algorithm worked, and our problem was we only had one engineer. His name was Stan Lanning. And what we did was we outsourced it. Does anyone here remember the Netflix prize? The Netflix prize, I got about a dozen hands. The Netflix prize was this. We gave out a, set of, a subset of data that was anonymized. And we said, hey, engineering community, if you can improve RMSE by at least 10%, we'll give you a million bucks. And we had about 5,000 engineers working on the project, which was freaking awesome. Okay? Um, and this was the leaderboard for the, the Netflix prize. And you'll notice something interesting right away, which is these are the world's weirdest names for teams. We've got Belcour's Pragmatic Chaos, and we've got Opera Solutions and Vandalay United. Like, what's going on? Okay, we've got some Seinfeld fans here. But what was happening was one of the key insights was if a team wasn't at the top of the leaderboard, they looked around to the left and the right, and they combined all their algorithms together with other teams. And this improved their predictive power. And the main insight here was the more algorithms, the better. It was a really helpful insight. We gave away the million bucks. And now we have this shiny new algorithm. It's 10% better at predicting your movie tastes. And the question is, will the new algorithm improve retention? How many people believe, yes, I believe in algorithms and engineering power? Yes, arms. Oh my god, it's a slightly skeptical environment today. <laughs> And how many people believe no? <laughs> and some of you have lost mu muscle control in your shoulders. <laughs> the answer is no. Total bummer. Okay? Now, I will tell you an amazing thing about the Netflix Prize. It was one of the, the best recruiting tactics. For the first time, engineers thought what Netflix was doing cool things. The other one was publishing the culture deck. Those are two big moves. You know, the main insight is most of our gains were a combination of stuff that customers could see plus the, the wonderful engineering work. And we, we knew that more algorithm was better. And here's an example of a new algorithm plus stuff that people could see. I already warned you, I'm always showing too much about my movie taste. But this row at the bottom, it says, Gib, because you like airplane, we believe you'll like The Breakfast Club and Ferris Bueller's Day Off. This is absolutely true. And a category of mo movies, because you're an old guy, cult comedies from the 1980s. And this was an example of, of work that you could see, giving context to why you will like stuff, plus an algorithm that was doing all the work. And this was an insight that, that, that improved retention, which was awesome. All right, so the world is looking pretty good. Uh, Crystal Chancuti, her job was to make it easy for you to find DVDs. Her metric was what percentage of members added at least six DVDs to their queue in the course of the month. Everything's going up and to the right. It's wonderful. And then around 2009, her metric starts to drop. And why? It's because of streaming. And Brent Avery's job, he was the dude focused on streaming. His metric was percentage of customers that watched at least 15 minutes in a month. And he's driving that metric way up and to the right. And by 2010, Netflix is a streaming company, which is way cool. Because of that, Netflix can now go international, which is so exciting. And lots of questions about personalization. So is it helpful to know that a person is French and they live in France? That's the question. How many people believe yes? And how many people believe no? Man, OK, it was 20% are not believers in this, and 80% are like, of course it's important to understand someone's French. And we were shocked. 
It was like the demographic. It's fundamentally better information to understand one or two titles that you know as, as for knowing your French. God, I hope this is in French. Can anybody verify? Quand un jeune garçon disparaît. That was bad, right? Okay. So this was a surprise. It's now an international company. Now, I mentioned that not all of these questions were hard. That damn Facebook came along, and we had created, we got 10 billion ratings, movies, from all of you to understand your tastes. And then Facebook came along, and they had this very simple gesture, thumb up, thumb down. So we tested five stars against thumb, down, thumb up and thumb down, and which one wins? The thumbs up and thumbs down. Much simpler. We, in fact, we got twice as much data from that. And that begs the question, what about the damn stars? What happens to them? Remember that fourth theory? Our fourth theory was as follows. If we could improve the quality of movies that you were watching, if we could drive you from a three-star average rating all the way up to a four-star average rating over time, of course your retention would improve, except it didn't which was a total bummer. And that was a great mystery. We could not figure out what the heck was going on. So we went on and we started talking to customers in focus groups. And of course, when I ask you a great movie, you tell me about some highly intellectual documentary you watched last night, uh-huh, or Hotel Rwanda, okay? But when you dig a little deeper, it turns out that there is a surprising number of people who are watching Paul Blart Mall Cop. Okay? Now notice, Hotel Rwanda is five star and Paul Blart's getting the valued three stars. And by the way, it was so freaking good they had to do Paul Blart Mall Cop too. Okay? And the insight is that movie, this is all about movie enjoyment. From time to time, people like watching a Leave My Brains at the Door Movie, okay? And what they do and what they say are often radically different. And so that fourth theory was just failed. Now, I don't know if anyone remembers this, but one of the first big deals was for six Adam Sandler movies. This is from The Ridiculous Six. The movie reviewer for The Ridiculous Six said, for those who found Paul Bart Mall Cop, intellectually demanding, you'll love Adam Sandler's Ridiculous Six, okay? I, I think that, you, how many of you watched Murder Mystery recently? Yeah, okay, they're even admitting to it, okay? I think that was his sixth deal. But this is the, the insight that movie enjoyment isn't about star ratings, really fascinating. So if you look carefully at Netflix today, again, this is my movie taste, it, it says that Casino, is a 98% match, that I will really enjoy Casino. It's not making any assessment about the quality of it. It's really trying to predict enjoyment today. My last thing on personalization, to help you understand how important personalization is to delight you in these hard to copy, margin enhancing ways, Netflix, in making their choices about what to invest in or not, in original content is working hard to predict how many people will watch Stranger Things. How many have watched it? Okay, it's 80%. So the guess was 100 million people would, would watch it, and so Netflix basically right sizes the investment. Okay, we'll spend about 500 million bucks on Stranger Things. Now my other question is how many of you watch BoJack Horseman? Okay, I love you guys, okay? So the prediction was about five million. I'm one of them. And, and they're right-sizing the investment, so they're able to spend 50 million bucks on this. And this is the way they're making the, the business work. If you looked at the 22 Emmys that they won last year, it's all niche stuff, okay? Because they're not focused on always delivering a blockbuster, just helping to find those sort of micro-targeted things based on your personalization data. And it's really driving a wonderful business. They're, they've answered the job of how do you delight customers in these hard-to-copy, margin-enhancing ways. All right, so I said I have a modern-day case for you. Netflix desperately needs your help. They find competing with Amazon much harder than they expected. It's, it's hard. 
And so here's the question. Today, and believe it or not, there are some people who have not used Netflix in the world. They're fence sitters. And this is the experience that they have. There's a button that says, try 30 days free. By the way, you can cancel any time. That's how you bring a fence sitter over the fence. Don't worry, you can cancel any time. It's on mobile experience. And when you talk to customers, you discover some interesting things. Huh, what does this cancel any time really mean? What happens is on day 32 and day 33, you get a lot of people calling in and saying, hey, I meant to cancel, but I forgot. And Netflix does the right thing. They back out the charge. However, that costs Netflix about 10 million bucks a year. So a bright product manager named Tom, Tom Williver, said, hey, what if we send a free trial reminder? What if on day 27, we send an email saying, your free trial is about to end? We text the person, free trial is about to end. The personalized homepage says, your free trial is about to end. So I got to ground you in a little bit of existing data, just for a second, before I share the results. So the question here is, if 100 people hit that page, what percent are going to click on the red button hand over their credit card to start their free trial. Shout some numbers out. I just want to hear the range. 70. 70. I've got a youthful enthusiasm. Skeptic? Five is low. OK, good. OK, so it went from five to seven. The answer is surprisingly small, about 2%. 2% hit that button, hand over their credit card. I, I think the main insight is not they didn't understand that they would have to give up their credit card. And that's hard for many people, I understand. So the T over V is 2%. The next question is, what percent of customers at the end of their free trial go on to becoming a paid member in month two? Give me some numbers. OK, 10 and 45. This one is surprisingly high. It's 90%. This free trial is a great way to understand what the service is about, to discover what titles are available or not. It's awesome. OK. So now we're going to do the free trial reminder. We're going to take a subset of customers. Today, it's like a million folks that come in as new newbies. And their experience on day 27, they're going to get very aggressive. Your free trial is about to end. You can cancel now. Make it easy. Is this a good thing to do? OK, I get some no people. What's, what's wrong with you people? What's the, what's the reason you don't want to do it? OK, so his guess was this is going to be very bad for the business. A lot of those people are going to hit the cancel button. OK, that's the guess. Are you guys curious about the result? OK, OK. Well, sorry, I'm done. <laughs> the only thing we care about is that 90%. Does it change, and how far down does it go? Rob's like, it's going to drop from 90 to 50. This is really going to suck for the business. It drops from 90 to 85. Not as bad as Rob thought. OK, so you're the product manager. Congratulations, Mr. Product Manager. You just lost 50 million bucks. That's the import of those five points. Huh. Let's talk about delighting customers in hard to copy, margin enhancing ways. We know the margin story. You lost 50 million bucks. What about the potential for delight? Is this a potentially good thing to do for a customer? Yes. yes. This is delight. I mean, gosh, remember the old days of AOL where they, you had to spend like 10 hours on the phone trying to cancel? Like, this is totally the opposite. OK? Wow, like, what kind of company would do this? Send a free trial reminder saying, you don't have to keep going, you can quit. There's the potential for delight. And that person who who chose to cancel at that moment, maybe it's summer and they don't want to be binge watching freaking Adam Sandler movies, OK? Um, and, and maybe they'll come back. And maybe they'll tell friend about this delightful experience. What's the hard to copy advantage that Netflix is building with this one idea? Trust. trust. And trust is a proxy for the brand. 
you could delight customers by doing this, build an even stronger, hard to copy, trusted brand, and you're gonna lose 50 million bucks. That's the story. Is this a high stakes decision or a low stakes decision? How many believe it's a high stakes decision? And how many people believe it's a low stakes decision? Okay, it's about 50-50 in the audience. My argument is this is low stakes, and I'll tell you why. This is 50 million against a company that's gonna do 14 billion in revenue this year, okay? Not too big a deal in that context. The other is this is completely reversible. If you feel like you got it wrong after the fact and chose to, to execute a free trial reminder for every new member who comes through the door, and you change your mind later, you just flip the switch back. And we as humans, we treat all of these decisions that we make as like, oh my God, we agonize. But if they're reversible, don't spend so much time worrying. And if it's only 50 million against 13 or 14 billion in revenue, it's okay. Like even marriages are reversible, okay? I've been married 28 years, okay? It's still working out. Who makes this decision? Who's Whose decision is this at the company? I love it. I love the front row. They're right here. Their answer was not the CEO, not the CFO, not the head of marketing. It's the product manager that's focused in this area. That person's the smartest in the room and understand. He guessed at all the data in these A-B tests. He was dead on for all of these. Now, Netflix is known for its culture. There's a cultural issue called debate, decide, and do. There was chair throwing. People thought that Tom Willer doing, you know, even contemplating this, losing 50 million, which is the world's stupidest idea. There's a rich debate. And then Tom says, I've made a decision. This is low stakes. I think it's going to delight customers. I think it's hard to copy. And I'm not worried about the 50 million. And he chose to do it. And then all those people who thought he was a freaking idiot magically lined up against him in support. And this is a cultural issue called debate, decide, and do. So Tom chose to do this. He sent to all. And this is the way Netflix works today. So what can you learn from this? This concept of in asking yourself a decision, is it a low stakes or a high stakes, as set, especially if it's reversible, is really helpful in making great decisions. The other thing you'll notice, in the early days, Netflix did not have the money to do the perfect new release, to, to double down on their inventory, but today they do. When you can afford it and you can find opportunities to essentially double down on delight, do it. And that's what Netflix chose to do in this instance. Now, I think this is the right thing to do. And this is a fascinating case because we can say that the cost of doing the right thing of the ethics and building an even stronger world-class brand is actually 50 million bucks. And in this case, it's the right thing to do. Now, punk startups early in their days, they can't afford to do this. But if you're aspiring to build a great and world-class company in the long term, these are the kinds of things that I encourage you to do. And then I gave you a little bit of insight into how decisions are made at Netflix. And really, the cultural aspects, just this one idea of debate, decide, do. At, at Amazon, it's disagree and commit. Very similar, just different language. So there's just three more things that I found super helpful for Netflix in, in growing. The first, this requires courage. You know, figuring these things out. Netflix had a two-hour conversation to make the $100 million investment in House of Cards. It was pretty fast, like, okay, let's frickin' do it. And Netflix, it took them 30 minutes to cancel the series when Kevin Spacey was engaged in sexual harassment. And these, this requires courage. The other thing that's required is patience. This is the market cap, which for many years for Netflix looked a lot like zero, okay? It's got a market cap of zero. Today, it's about 150 billion. And it only takes 20 years to build a great company, okay? So it takes a lot of patience. Now I want you to notice that little blip after 2011. Anybody know what happened here? That was Quickster. 
the company separated, the, it, it intended to separate the DVD business. You would go to quickster.com to get your DVDs, and Netflix would be the streaming. And it went incredibly poorly. <laughs> okay? Within the first week, they were lampooned on Saturday Night Live. They did an imitation of this, this horrible video, and, and, and this was the assessment. Okay? And my point here is this requires humility. From time to time, you're going to get it wrong. Okay? And just frickin' brush yourself off and go back to it. So I work with lots of different companies and trying to help assess whether they're they are, in fact, obsessed. You'll learn I'm pretty obsessive myself. Um, but what I look for is, do they have access to existing data? Are, are they sufficiently data focused? Are they getting the data that helps understand the customer and also the business? Are they engaged in qualitative and focus groups and talking to customers to get basic insight of why people like Paul Bart Mall Cop 2? Are they engaged in survey data? I did an NPS survey with you at the beginning to help make a general assessment of the quality of Netflix with the audience here. And the big dog, and really required to understand this balancing act between a delight and margin, is A-B testing. This is what's required to help answer a lot of these questions. And the last thing, I hope you saw it twice, for the overall product and for just the personalization swim lane, that one area, there was a strategy that was trying to answer the question, how do you delight customers in hard to copy margin enhancing ways? It wasn't always right, but there was a strategy. So for me, customer obsession is about putting the customer at the center of everything you do to delight customers in hard to copy margin enhancing ways to invent the future. And with that, I'd like to say thank you. <laughs>